What's up, everyone? Welcome to Unmasked, where things are discovered, uncovered, brought to the light, and made known. I'm your host, Lamar Barrett, coming live to you from PG County, Maryland. If you're interested in finding out about the untold stories behind being a college coach, this is the show for you. Being a former assistant men's college basketball coach for 16 years, there are so many untold stories behind the scenes in the life of a college basketball coach. Now, let's unmask them. Today's guest is a young and bright assistant. I say young, but he's been in the business for a long time. Still a young coach uh, with a great basketball mind. He's an excellent talent evaluator, a great teacher, uh, a future head coach in this business in my mind. And he's a native of uh, the Washington, D.C., Virginia, Maryland area, the DMV, as everyone knows it, Keith Ergo. Now, now a little bit about Keith before we bring him on. Uh, I actually knew Keith when he was a high school basketball player at, at Gonzaga High School, Gonzaga College High School uh, in Washington, D.C. So uh, I was coaching uh, at Oxford Hill. And, and then from there, he goes on and he's a two-sport uh, athlete, you know, at Fairfield. We had a good career as a basketball player and lacrosse. Uh, and then from there, once he finished an OT and, and got his degree, uh, he, he really went into uh, the real world a little bit, but he was over uh, playing for Peace Incorporation and spent some time over in, in, in Europe uh, for a few years before coming back home and probably really discovering what his passion for after being in real estate a little bit. Um, but he decided what his passion was and he decided to chase his dream, which was basketball and uh, he had a chance to go back to his alma mater, and he's an assistant coach there uh, with Steve Turner from 04 to 07, um, and with some really, really, really powerful program, national program. Uh, so they did a great job while they were there. And then he goes to Villanova, and he's the uh, video coordinator for a year at Villanova. And, uh, you know, and then two years he spent as the director of basketball operations, um, and then he's an assistant coach for one year with Jay Wright, and then he gets to go to Penn State. Uh, with Pat Chambers, who, uh, you know, did a terrific job up at Penn State, uh, you know, for the last 10 years. Uh, Keith has spent two years, spent the first two years as an assistant coach, uh, the last eight years as the present moment as the associate head coach at Penn State. And, uh, you know, this is a guy I've known. I've seen him grow from high school kid to where he is. And like I said, there's no doubt in my mind he'll be a head coach somewhere in this profession one day. I want to say welcome to the show, Keith. Hey, Lamar, thank you so much for having me, man. I appreciate it. It's fantastic to be a part of the show. Yeah, man. So, you know, the one thing I said, like, it's always when you get to see kids grow up. And I'm like, wow, I'm when you when I'm 26, 27 years old, and then watching you as a high school kid, that was, that was you know, to see where you are now, man, I, I'm, I'm just so proud of you to see where that happens. And, um, you know, Gonzaga always produces not just great athletes, but great people as well. So I just want to say that, man. I appreciate it, man. And uh, we had some great teams back then, man. And Oxen Hill was always a battle as well. So, you know, the, the, the area, the, the, it doesn't get much better than the DMV when it comes to high school basketball. And, you know, people always ask me what's the best high school basketball league. And I think from top to bottom, not just because I'm biased and played in it. I just think from top to bottom, uh, it's hard pressed to find. There are a lot of great, great leagues and great schools high schools in the country, but from top to bottom, the WCAC is, if not the best, it's certainly one of the top two or three in the, in the country. Um, not just because of players though. It's, it's just the schools, the, uh, the coaches, the programs themselves are as good as it gets. I mean, you go to those practices and it doesn't matter if you're at St. Mary's Reichen, St. John's, Paul VI, O'Connell, DeMath, Gonzaga, whatever it might be, St. John's, it, it doesn't matter. Those coaches run college level practices Kids coming out of that league are as prepared for the college level as you'll ever see a across the country. So it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you on that. Well, look, man, we're here to get unmasked. And, uh, you know, I've been, I've been actually waiting to get this show right here. <laughs> so we're going to gonna jump right into it, man. And yeah, man. So, so you, you know, and you can talk about it at any time from, you know, what you're filling over the early days or even when you went to Penn State. But, so there's no handbook, man, of being a college coach. Um, no. Tell me about first day or the first week, first month after things are done with human resources and orientation, like, especially when no one gives you direction. Like everyone thinks they know, but yeah, until they know, you get no, into no. it, like yeah. talk about it, man, when there's no direction. Well, 
Well, shoot. When I was when I became the video coordinator at Villanova, it was an internship. I had just been married. I left a high level paying job to take that job. My wife was working in Silver Spring. We had just bought a house in Silver Spring, Maryland, and I decided to move up there, stay in a dorm dorm room for a couple of months. Uh, I pretty much lived in the office. And back then they were still in the old pavilion before the Davis Practice Center was being built. It was being built as I got the job, but it was like a little closet in the basement of the pavilion. And uh, I had no idea how to even turn a VCR or DVD player on, man. And I took this job and I had to learn everything from scratch, how to record. I just spent all day, all night, you know, former video coordinator, uh, Andrew Francis, who's now a cow, was a long time at was Fran McCaffrey at Siena and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, Iowa before being a cow, but you know, he, he had taken, I, I had uh, taken over for him. So I called him like all hours of the night, asking, begging questions. And, you know, once, once you're a part of that Villanova family, you know, it's your job, even though you leave to answer the phone, help anybody out, that's what you do. And really across the landscape of the business, but he used to help me. Uh, and and uh, I called Jason Crafton who used to have that job, but, you know, it, it was literally all night, all day, trying to figure out how to get things done. And you're pretty much left on your own. And uh, the bottom line is, if you don't figure it out, you know, Jay's going to have something to say to you, right? So he doesn't care how you get it done, but you got to get it done. So it's just people don't understand the hours and the time commitment. And when the reality is, it's not even basketball. For most part, you know, the jobs of the staff are to really make sure you take care of all the daily ins and outs so the head coach can really focus on the team and practice the actual X's and O's, you know, uh, assistants and support staff. You spend 75% of your time off the court uh, and only probably 25, if that on the court, you know? Um, so I don't think people quite comprehend. They're like, you know, for instance, a lot of people, you know, after the season, people are like, Oh, the season's over. Like, what do you do now? It's like, you know, you don't, you're not in games. I'm like, what? It's actually much more, the time commitments ends up being more during the off season than it is during season. Um, just recruiting and, you know, it's still, it's big business, multi, multi billion, you know, billion dollar business division one basketball is. And each program at the highest of levels is a multi-million dollar business. It's got to be run on a daily basis. So people just don't quite understand that uh, the actual X's and O's and on the court is, is, is a, a very low percentage of the time spent for any staff member or any assistant coach. That's that's so true, man. I'm, you touched on a lot of things, and I'm sure we're, it'll come back up later on, but you touched on a lot of things just from the beginning. So I'm glad that uh, I hope a lot of people understand that those are teaching moments uh, that you just dropped. And you talked about – so people don't understand the recruiting part either, like no. – uh, it's the lifeline of college athletics. Like you have to get good players, you need to get good people and you want to get good students. Like, and it's not always, you got to be an A student or, no. or like, you got to be a high B student. It's like, you got to have a student that, 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 like that wants to get a degree that, that needs to you know, understand like the importance of education. So when I talk about recruiting, like what was your best and worst recruiting story over the years? Like if you can talk about like, you know, you know, you say, hey, man, I, I spent this much time on a kid and, you know, wh whether we didn't get them or not. But what's your best and worst recruiting stories? Well, I got a lot of them, man. I got to be careful. But, um, you know, for, you know, like when I was when I was at, at Villanova, um, you know, it's funny because you come into such like in Villanova. I came into unbelievable success. I was the video coordinator in the first year. We go to the Sweet 16. Right. The next year, I'm the uh, director of ops. We go to the Final Four in 2009, right? So the, pro the, the the program had already been established at a high level. The people before me had worked so much through the so much um, more through the difficulties of the early years of Jay Wright and Villanova, and I got to reap the rewards, right? Um, but you know, recruiting, for instance, um, Josh Hart. With the, the, the toughest part, like, and Chris Jenkins, Chris Jenkins and Josh are like, we were recruiting Chris Jenkins and Nate Britt at Villanova together, kind of, because, you know, most of the people were recruiting them at a, you know, as, a, as kind of like a package. Uh, for those of you who know Chris Jenkins and, and Nate Britt, they've lived together, they live together. You know, the Britt family is one of the most amazing families on the planet, in my opinion. And they took uh, Chris in and, and really guided him through grade school and high school and, and college. And, 
the relationships that I developed with those guys over the years. But I was recruiting those guys at Villanova. And then when things happened, I went on to Penn State and recruited them at Penn State. But I had to be careful because um, obviously, you know, Villanova is the mothership when you're under that umbrella and you really don't want to mess around. So when I was younger and I was really ambitious in recruiting, I, I continue to recruit those guys. And, and you know, in hindsight, probably, you know, um, down to, down, Josh Hart, actually, the day of his commitment came down to Penn State and Villanova because what Jay had taught Pat Chambers and I is it's all about relationships. You know, everything you do in any business, but specifically basketball, if you're in it for the right reasons, it's about developing authentic, unique relationships, something that Jay Wright, there, in my opinion, there's nobody better in the country that he teaches his staff to do and understand why you're in the business is to have lifelong lasting relationships that are going to be 40 years for the really relationships for the next 40 years of your life. So I had developed such an unbelievable relationship with the heart and Moses heart at Josh's father and Josh um, that it came down actually to Villanova and Penn state, believe it or not, he made the right decision clearly. Uh, and as did Chris Jenkins, both of those guys we were in pretty heavily with, but um, you know, there's, there's so many different stories. Like I traveled um, we, we currently have a, a player, um, Abdus Simbala. So I, I traveled over to Cameroon without him to visit his family uh, to recruit, which was wild. I, I flew to the, the Cameroon literally for 72 hours just to sit with his family because that's what I promised that I would do if he committed to Penn State. Um, you know, things like that. People don't quite, quite comprehend. Oh, you go to the Cameroon. No, I, I literally flew for almost 30 hours was on the ground for about, you know, 24 to 36 hours and then flew another 36 hours back, you know, just to meet a family in the Cameroon. Like those are the things that you do, you know, in recruiting that people don't quite understand. But if you want to be at a high level and you want to, you want to do what you say you're going to do, you want to honestly uh, be trustworthy and develop the real authentic relationships. You got to do things that most people think you're absolutely nuts for doing. And as a result, you really don't, you miss out on a lot with your own family. I got four kids. Um, that's why this pandemic here in the last six, seven months was, was, was a blessing and a curse. Honestly, it was a blessing because I got to spend some amazing amount of time with my kids at a crucial time in their lives and my wife. Um, but also a curse because, you know, some of the things that happened at Penn state for the first time in history, we got, we, we, we were doing a lot of amazing things and got cut out of the NCAA experience and a lot of time over the summer with our guys. But um, there's so many different things in recruiting. I mean, obviously you, what, when you're young, you don't understand, you're going to hear a lot more no's than you are yeses, And that's completely normal. Um, but what you can't do is you can't get upset, discouraged and get resentful um, because if you're truly about who you say you are, well, then those relationships need to matter. And today's, in today's climate, there's a very good chance that your initial recruit doesn't commit to you, but it, you might get them in a year or two. So you never want to talk negatively about other schools and you never want to get upset because everybody's got their own journey. So as you get older and older in the business, you understand kids got to make decisions for themselves and their family, and they got to figure it out as they go. So you can't think you could have worked as hard as you possibly ever could have. You could have done everything in your power to, to get a, to get a big time recruit. And for whatever reason, they just didn't choose you, the, the head coach or the program or the university that you're currently at. Well, you can't get discouraged. It's not your fault. You know, every kid's on their journey. And uh, that's one of the big, biggest things that one of the biggest challenges I had to, to adjust to as I got older and older, more experienced is understanding that regardless of what kind of effort, energy, and the relationship that I had, you might not necessarily get the kid to commit to your university. Um, you know, one of the toughest ones was um, uh, obviously um, there's, there's a, there's a kid, she, I forgot what was wrong, kid who went to Emotep. Oh my God. Brandon Austin, Brandon Austin. Brandon Austin committed to Penn State, right? Um, 
And it was a huge, huge recruit at the time at Penn State. I mean, I was living in Philadelphia, essentially, spending as much time as I possibly could in that area, uh, trying to recruit kids to Penn State for the first time, kind of. And, and Pat Chambers and I really wanted to start a pipeline in Philadelphia. So we spent, I spent maybe four or five days a week for the first two years I was at Penn State down in Philadelphia, bouncing around to school after school. And just, um, and Brandon Austin developed an amazing relationship with him and his, his family. And he was committed to us for several months. Um, and then he started to blow up and bigger schools started to come into play. And then, you know, obviously he ended up decommitting. And when you get a kid to commit and then decommit, it's like your whole world turns upside down. All right. Um, you know, he ends up going to Providence and the rest of his He was just an unbelievable player. He had some struggles uh, off the court, but still a great player um, and kind of a product of his environment, honestly. But, you know, some of the some of those uh, commitments and then decommitments, they're hard to swallow for a while. You know, you try to figure out the hell did I do wrong? You know, uh, why why all of a sudden did uh, did the relationship go sour or something? And most of the time it didn't. It was just. It's just outside forces you can't control. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's not, not the great, great jewels you're dropping right there. And I, I'm going to say this while we're, while we're talking before it even go into the next question. A Gonzaga guy was my biggest uh, regret. Said Lindsay, I still go back to it. But oh, Cedric was phenomenal. <laughs> but you know what? Relationship has always been great with him and his family. Yeah. It made the best decision for him and – and it worked out for him, and, and uh, I'm so happy happy for that kid because I did see him grow up, you know, from yeah. another yeah. kid I saw grow up in the area from when he was a, you know, eighth, seventh, eighth grader to, you know, him graduating to high school. So I, I'm going I'm to I'm say Gonzaga guy is my biggest, biggest disappointment. I'm going to put that on now. So. Seb, was, Seb was an unbelievable player. They, they had some great teams when he was when he was there, and he had a great career at Richmond, man. Yeah, you great know. career. And that's what, that's what I find, you know, the more and more you're in this, you got to just, you can't take things personal, you know? And, uh, and that's what, especially now more than ever. And uh, again, these are still kids, you know, they're still young men trying to figure out what the right decisions are for them. And everybody's kind of on their own journey. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the biggest things I try to tell younger coaches, don't get so resentful. Don't, don't hold grudges with other coaches in the business because you think they did this or that. And, you know, maybe you did everything right. It's just the school wasn't the right fit What for whatever reason, you know, and, and don't, that, that's just reality. Don't get upset at them or the family or the other coaching staff that, you know, the, a lot of coaches get upset at the schools that end up getting the kids that they were recruiting. That does you no good, you know, and there's so many incredible players. Now the game has evolved so much. Uh, the exposure is unlike any other time. Um, so there's just so many high level players, you know, I just, you just can't get uh, discouraged at, at missing out on a few, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with some young coaches that get their first assistant coaching jobs and they you know, recruit and they get all worked up at the fact that they didn't get this guy or that guy. And they think it's their fault. I'm like, dude, believe me, man, you're going to hear some more no's a lot more no's than you are. Yeses. It's so true. Business difficult. <laughs> so true. So you talked about something early, and you touched on it, man. This is just interesting. I say it all the time. Like, what did you have to sacrifice? I don't even say give up anymore, but yeah. what did you have to sacrifice, man, achieving your current level of success? Whew. You got to sacrifice a lot of personal, um, personal things in your life. I mean, you got to sacrifice. Unfortunately, I have an unbelievable. Well, fortunately, I have a phenomenal uh, wife who's able to kind of uh hold down the fort at home but you know you sacrifice a lot of time with your family you don't get to take the typical vacations or the weekends off that a lot of normal um not normal but other businesses um allow you to do like you don't have weekends i mean you work 365 days a year you always have your phone on you uh regardless of whether or not it's christmas or regardless of whether or not you're on your one week vacation in may or one week vacation in, in august um you know you're just constantly um, communicating on a regular basis with whether or not it's your own team, your own staff or recruits, their families, um, coaches, whatever it might be. So you sacrifice a lot of time with your own family. Um, you know, I got a big family, nine boys and a girl in my immediate family. 
and I sacrifice a lot of family time with them. I don't get to see my brothers as much or spend time with my parents or, you know, you miss out on a lot of holidays and normal family vacations. The family get togethers would happen like around Easter, things like that. You know, most of my family goes down to Florida. My brothers bring their families and everybody's together. I don't get to do that because we're in the thick of the season. You know, you miss out on some, you know, family events like weddings sometimes you miss out on best friends i've missed you know some of three or four of my best friends out of four or five group of i miss their weddings as a result of having games and the, you know stuff like that you just you, you miss out on a lot of that stuff that you got to sacrifice to reach your goals and um it's tough and, and not only that you know you love the game of basketball so a lot of people think they love the game of basketball um but when they get into the business, it's like a player. There are so many players that think they love the game of basketball. But when they get to this level, the highest of levels, they realize, and you realize, they just like it. They like the, the aura of basketball. They like what it, it makes them look like. But when it comes down to the amount of work that you need to put in, the amount of sacrifice, you have to absolutely love eat, sleep, and breathe the game to be successful at this level. And it's the same thing with coaching. You think you love the game of basketball. Okay, well, you take a job, and next thing you know, you're never on the court. You don't even get to coach. There's only three assistant coaches that get to actually have a ball and work drills and, and work, you know, work out guys and things like that. But most of the time, if you're recruiting, you're not even around your own team. You might be gone for two or three days, come back, and you have no idea what's going on within your own locker room. You weren't at practice the last two days. You're like, wait, why are we doing that? You know, but you have to sacrifice that. Um, because a lot of the times you have nothing to do with the X's and O's, right? Um, so it's, it's um, you know, you think you're just going to be around basketball the whole time. Well, you're not. You're not around basketball at this level. Um, a lot of guys in some programs, and now I, I couldn't do this, but some programs have some guys, their third assistant, whatever it be, he might be on the road and miss games. He might be recruiting during, you know, I couldn't do that because you work so hard for that two and a half hours you know, blood, sweat, and tears. I, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, because, you know, what I've learned is the most important thing is the guys in that locker room that did say yes, as opposed to the guys you got, you're trying to say yes. So you better devote as much attention, if not more, almost all your attention to the guys that did say yes in that locker room than the ones that you're trying to court to come to, to wherever you are. That's, that's, that's some great stuff right there, man. That That's great stuff, Keith. Like, we know this too, scout reports, man, that's huge. Like you just yeah. talked about like being on the floor, like being a part, like that's, that's a big thing. And, and, and us coaches take that personal because you're the ones who watching, you know, six, seven, eight games. So you oh, got yeah. so much invested into it. You can always tell who scout reporter is because they're on the sideline. They're jumping oh, yeah, up going down. Nuts. You know, when you're not doing stuff right, they're yelling and screaming, but then like, you know, and then you got to think about it. And I, and, I, and I started thinking about it more and more when I did this show. It's like, these kids have, they have to go to class. They, they have a lot of stuff that they're doing as well. And they oh, yeah. give them this, all this information. And so you got to figure out, you got to kind of balance, like, how much can I really give them versus trying to overload them with information? And so yeah. then, you, and then you, you got the coach that, you, you know, you're telling the coach, like, your coach is, you know, kid is two for his last 30 from three. But then as soon as he made two threes in a row, oh, coach coach looking like, yeah. <laughs> he like, I thought he couldn't shoot. Coach, I know he said he couldn't shoot. I said he's struggling. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> talk, about your best, talk about your best and worst scouting report you might have had over the years. Oh, this is hilarious, actually. Villanova, my first scouting report. And, uh, you know, guys were messing with me. Pat Chambers was messing with me, even though he wasn't there, because uh, I leaned on him a lot, even when he was at BU. And, um, Jason Donnelly, and Doug West, and a lot of these guys. Um, but my first scouting report, they're like, look, when you get into your one-on-one -on -one meeting with coach, you got to know everything about each player. It's not even just about, you got to know their high school coach, their AAU coach. He's going to ask you, you know, what, tell me about this guy. So they had me like literally sitting, I, I, I didn't sleep for days. I was so fired up. And I was, I, I thought I, I knew everything. I had flashcards for every single player, AAU, where they were, grade school, blah, blah, blah. And uh, thinking that he was, you know, in that one-on-one -on -one meeting, he was going to ask me something about like the ninth man on the team or the 11th man like you know where did he play grade school what parish was he a part of or something I, I was that dialed in right 
He didn't ask me one of those questions. I sat in there. He didn't even seem interested, you know, in what I was doing. I had every, I had pages and pages and pages. He's like, look, Keith, less is more. You know, I just need to know their four cuts. I need to know one or two tendencies. These guys, we don't want to overload them. Like you mentioned, the more you give them, the less likely they are. We got to give them a couple of things here and there. It's really about us. We get so caught up in what they're doing, but the reality is you're not changing how you play from game to game. It's just happening too quick. You can't build the habits from in two days that you're going to need just to play this specific offense. No, you got to stay consistent on what you do, do defensively and offensively and not really worry about what they do. You got, you got to have an idea of what their top four or something sets in some of their end of game situations, really baseline out of bounds and line out of bounds stuff. But you can't get too caught up in what they do because you're not going to really change what you do based off of, of their of their calls. Right. So I was all dialed in. I sit down. He doesn't ask me any of those personal questions. I was like, I spent hours upon hours knowing who the hell was a grade school coach, this and that. So we get set, right? I'll never forget it. We're going through a walkthrough. I step on the court and uh, there's a period of time. Okay, now let's go. Let's go through the first play, right? So the white team gets out, blue gets set up. And I go to, to, to walk through the play. Everybody's on me. All eyes on me. And I'm, he's like, okay, Ergs, why don't you, you know, what's the first set? I froze. I'm sitting there in a total panic. I'm freezing. The whole program's looking at me on the court. I've completely froze. Nothing's coming out of my mouth. I, I had rehearsed this in the mirror 150,000 times. I knew exactly what was going to happen. He calls my name. Everybody's on the court. All eyes on me. And I couldn't say a word for like 25, 30 seconds. He, we had gone over the script of what play, like on our practice plan, we're going to go over this set. But so he then picked, he's like, all right, well, boom, boom, boom. and as soon as he said that, he, he, I snapped out and I started going around, but for 30 seconds, it was complete silence. And I was in a panic mode and I turned bright red. I was totally flustered. Meanwhile, the other assistant coaches thought it was the funniest thing on the planet. Everybody thought it was great. The players were messing with me. Jay Wright was joking with me the whole year. After that, I was, you know, I was perfectly fine, but I will never forget my first scouting report. The first time I was on the court at Villanova, completely frozen. And I thought I was done. I thought he was going to bring me in after practice and say, look, man, this isn't going to work. You're going to have to, we're going to have to adjust some things. I don't want you doing any more scouts. He thought it was hilarious though. From that point forward, I was, I was kind of acclimated, so to speak, but I'll never forget that. You know, you get caught up. Like you, you mentioned, you think your, your scouting report's really going to be the difference, right? You know, but it's, it's really not uh, the, the bottom line is you, er, your preparation, you did everything you could. Right. But you can't get upset if you got two days prep or sometimes one day prep or sometimes no prep in when you're in a, an EMT or or a conference tournament and you're working with the scout team. Right. And you get pissed off at them because they don't know how to run this complicated play that Purdue runs. And you're like, you got it. You just drew that up for them to walk out and try to run at full speed. It takes teams weeks to get their offensives down. And you're you're yelling and screaming at these kids and you literally just drew it up. You could barely draw it up yourself. You know, we get all worked up, like you know, and uh, so those are things that when you're, you're you're a little bit older, you time to take it easy. You understand, it's uh, you got to do the best you can, providing the information, and then you know the players are going to have to go out there and act, you know, obviously execute. Um, but fortunately, Jay and Pat, we didn't have a whole complicated, complex scouting report, and uh, something that hopefully, if I get the opportunity to be a head coach, I'll make sure less is more you know, more, a couple of tendencies, a couple of sets here and there, give them an idea of what's going on and then really focus on yourselves. Not don't get caught up too much on the opponent. Good stuff, man. That's good stuff. Um, what's, what's the biggest challenge you think you've experienced since you've become a college coach? I mean, this, this is year 14 for you. So like, but what's the balance, biggest challenge? Balance, balance, understanding that you still have a family. You, you want to be successful understanding that you need to work. And, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, what I've realized here in this last six to eight months since the pandemic, you know, you can work a lot smarter, not necessarily harder, you know, working 18 hours or 17 hours thinking that you're getting, you know, you're incredibly productive. Now, what I've come to realize is that, you know, you can still have a balanced life with your family. You know, you can still recruit at a high level. You can still, have phenomenal relationships with your own staff and your own players by also having a little bit balanced personal life as well. You don't have to just spend every single waking hour, 
um, working, you know, uh, it can be non-productive. And as a result, your staff and yourself, you might actually be a little bit more refreshed, um, the more personal time that when you do dive into work, you get a lot more done. You're, lo- you're much more productive because you're more fresh. Um, that's what I've really realized here in the last six to eight months is um, you can be a hell of a lot more productive if you got a balanced life. Um, so that's, 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 that's one of the main things that I've, that I struggled with early on trying to be so successful that just literally ignoring a lot of my personal life just to get to where I am, uh, now realizing you can do both, but you know, you gotta have, you gotta have balance in order to, to really, uh, have a great perspective. Um, and that'll kind of lighten the load when you don't get a recruit, right? Um, when you do you're how many teams have gone undefeated in the last 20 years? Very few, if any, right? You're not going to go undefeated. You know, your team could play the best game that they've played all year and still lose by one. And you got to be understanding of that and understand that, you know, you just got to remain patient and consistent in everything you do. Um, organization is very important. Uh, organization and detail. And if you have organi- uh, high level organization and detail, then you can, you can actually have more balance in your personal life, which is important. Yeah, that's that's all true, true stuff right there, man. Like this, and I, I know who you are. I've seen you out in the recruiting, I've seen the coaching. Yeah. And like, and and so you know, you like you said, you were at Villanova, you at Penn State, you're you at power five, you're in power five leagues, and yeah. uh, you know, so you're at the highest level. Do you ever find that there are things about you that people misunderstand? What are they? Oh, I'm sure uh, there's a lot. <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of guys that get um, perceived as just recruiters, so to speak. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's a misunderstanding. Uh, a lot of guys, cause, cause you're always on the road, you're always recruiting. You might, be known to get uh, high level players or whatever it might be. So people just assume you're just a recruiter and you're not much of a X's and O's or basketball guy. Um, and that's just, I, I think, um, I think that's kind of a misunderstanding uh, with regards to me, maybe sometimes, um, cause I'm, I'm very active on the court. Um, I do a lot of our scouts. I've been our defense coordinator for the last seven or eight years. Um, I do, and have done for Pat Chambers and currently for Coach Ferry. Um, a lot of the matchups, every game I do every matchup. So I control who comes out of a timeout, who's guarding who, who's switching, what we're doing on the defensive end. And naturally, as a result, I study a lot of offenses. So I know a lot about offense and we coordinate constantly with the Ferry and I and Pat Chambers. So there's just a, you know, in the game of basketball, it's 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 funny. It's, it's like, it's also one of those things where, okay, you're a little guy, you don't know how to coach big guys. No, big guys always want to be little and little guys always want to be big guys. So I was like, oh, you need a big guy to coach a big man. Well, no, they definitely have that experience, but I'm the one coming off the ball. I know exactly what a big man's going to do and how to exploit it. So I got to teach a big guy, yo, this is what they're looking off the ball. You make this mistake, a little guy's going to dig. And, you know, there's all, it's just everybody has a great understanding of the game of basketball who coaches. And you're not just a recruiter you could do everything and be highly successful at all of those things. Um, which I think is just a misunderstanding throughout our business. A lot of guys get labeled as just X's and O's guys or just recruiting guys. And I, I think you can't be in this business if you don't know what you're doing on both, both sides. So, so true, man. I agree with you on that. Um, what, what do you try to teach or even educate your players besides just basketball? Oh, everything. Are you kidding me? We don't even focus as much on basketball, man. We, one of the things that the Jay Wright and Pat Chambers uh, have taught us is everything is about relationships. The bottom line is if, if you have authentic and real relationships and you really, if these kids believe that, and trust you that you care more about them as people than you ever do on the basketball court. And you spend so much time with them off the court, developing these relationships that they wouldn't be at this level if they couldn't play ball. 
right? They're going to play as hard as they possibly can for guys who they know care more about them off the court, right? If, if they don't think you care about what happens with them, say a kid gets hurt and you're just going to push them off to the side, well, they know that. They feed off like they're not gonna they're not gonna give you everything they have you're asking them to do so much that if you don't care about them and their success on and off the court then you're not going to get their highest level of effort on the court so that that's what one thing that i think is more important we, we do a hell of a lot of um life skills um, we spend a lot of time in the community and uh being grateful for what we have because you got to understand, you know, at a place like Penn State, 750,000 living, breathing, paying alums. It's the largest living alumni association in the world, right? So there, are those 750,000 alums, a high percentage of them have kids. And they grow up Penn State fans, right? And they're watching you. You are their role model, Lamar Stevens. So when you're in the community, they're paying attention to every little thing that you do. You know, and at this level, you're a celebrity, which is good and bad, right? Especially in today's day and age. We think it's easy. No, kids got phones out all the time. They're watching every single thing you do. You're being critiqued constantly. And um, so it's very important that you understand that you need to be grateful for the opportunity that you have and you need to, to give back to those individuals because they're, they're, they're literally all eyes on you, they're growing up idolizing you. So all the decisions that you make on and off the court really affect a lot of their, their behavior as well. Um, so it's, it's really important to understand that you need to care about these kids as men, uh, more so as players, uh, and nine times out of 10, the playing takes care of itself. You know, Because everybody in the country's got the drills, right? They're, basketball, you know, every, it's, it's not rocket science. We've all been about basketball. We've all seen every drill under the sun. We all have incredible amounts of relationships with the NBA guys and other college guys and GMs, right? You know, so uh, some coaches are going to say, you come here, you know, you'll be a pro. Well, no, I can't make you a pro. That's God-given talent that your family, you, your God created you, your, your parents created you. I can't act like I did, right? But I'm going to be here every step of the way. I know every drill. I'll be here anytime you need me to on the court to run you through things. I'll motivate you. I'll inspire you. But ultimately, it's going to be the kids' effort and dedication. It's collaboration between the players and the coaching staff. Uh, but I would say the most important thing is understanding developing incredible relationships off the court um, is more important than anything else anything else awesome awesome man um what what are your your best and worst memories in coaching because i think a lot of times people get caught up in wins and losses a lot of times um but like what's your best and worst memories in coaching holy cow best and worst. i mean obviously one of the best memories is is beating pit at the buzzer essentially with scotty reynolds and the boston garden to 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 advance mm -hmm. the final four that was one of the coolest, if not the coolest moment in my um, coaching career. It was, it was electric. It was, it was one of the most amazing experiences to be a part of Jay Wright's first Final Four staff. Um, uh, what else? I mean, obviously, um, last year was an amazing ride with Penn State. Uh, all the blood, sweat, and tears, uh, building a program from scratch, um, the right way to try to keep it sustainable in an incredible league like the Big Ten, finally come to fruition and be ranked number ninth in country last year. Penn State being ranked ninth in the country for several weeks in the top 25 for weeks um, last year, being poised to make a huge run in the Big Ten tournament. And the hearing the worst memory was – not being able to hear our name called on selection Sunday for our guys, for our, for our staff. Um, <laughs> we had worked so incredibly long and hard to get the program to that point. And to have that stolen for us was gut wrenching to have it stolen to, to have Lamar Stevens be seven points from breaking the all time scoring record at Penn state and still have, 
at least one Big Ten tournament game and at least one C- one NCAA game. I mean, it was he was breaking it. It, it was there was no if ands buts about it. And Taylor Battle is now a part of our staff who has the record. To watch that happen to a kid like Lamar Stevens was just a gut wrenching gut wrenching blow. Um, I mean, there's so many incredible highlights. There's nothing quite like winning games at 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 Michigan State. Last year we beat Michigan, Michigan State, Purdue, all on the road. Things that Penn State had never done in its history. Never beaten that those those teams in the same year on the road. Um, you know, knocking off number four Michigan at home when we were like oh and eight. Trey Burke was they made the final four that year. Trey Burke was. I think player of the year or something like that. They came in like second or fourth in the country. It was a sold out crowd. We upset them. We hadn't won a game. I don't think in the big 10 and uh, we upset them storm court, uh, you know, the, the uh, storm into the courts, but uh, I've had some incredible moments as, as uh, being on the bench at both Villanova and, uh, and, uh, and Penn state. Uh, but probably the, the hardest moment was, um, the shutdown last last spring. Yeah, especially with y'all, what y'all had done there, like you said, I, you were 100% right. Like, you had gotten it to where you, where y'all wanted. And, you know, like you said, poor, you know, having a chance to have a, uh, have a great run would have been, that would have been awesome. And, uh, yeah. you know, Lamar Stevens is a great kid too. So, that, you know, you probably wanted it for him as well. So uh, He's incredible. And also another another phenomenal moment on there uh, was the run we had in the NIT. We felt like we were one of the best teams in the country. The Big Ten gets blighted that year, only got four teams in. Meanwhile, like three of those four made it to Sweet 16. One of them got to the Final Four. You know, we, we swept through and mauled almost everybody other than our first game against Temple. We mauled everybody. Um, route to an uh, NIT championship in the garden, which was pretty cool. Uh, I think that was what, 2018. That was pretty, you know, that was pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I'm a, I'm, this is kind of a lighter moment. So, and then this, and we don't, I don't, I don't like names. So people don't use the call names, but like, what is the strangest thing that a player has done outside of the basketball court since you've been, been coaching? Strangest? Oh my goodness. There's too many. I'm not even, I, I, that's a, that's a, that's a loaded question, Lamar. I can't really get into a lot of the things that I've seen. I've seen some crazy things, man. Uh, one of the best ones I will say is Lamar Stevens, Lamar's climb where he uh, last spring, we had an everyone is awesome day. It was Saturday against, I think I want to say Rutgers, a mid afternoon game sold out crowd. And prior to that, I have a uh, four children. My third Samantha Rose who's five years old has down syndrome Lamar Stevens with our marketing director put together a, uh, I don't know, probably eight, eight page um, illustration book uh, called Lamar's Climb. And it's his journey from Roman Catholic in Philadelphia all the way to Penn State. And what it was, is every page was illustrated by a, a child with Down syndrome. Uh, pretty remarkable. My, my daughter was, was featured in the book as well. And uh, the day of the game, he, he stayed after and signed 500 books. It was a massive hit got requests for thousands of books after that. Um, one of the coolest experiences that I've ever been a part of and something that brought Lamar and I even closer. Uh, he has a, a phenomenal bond with my daughter, Samantha, but that wasn't a strange thing, but it was one of the most emotional probably and one of the neatest things that I've ever been a part of with a player. Wow, that's, that's powerful. That's very powerful. I mean, for him to do that, that that's some awesome stuff, man. Wow. Um, now, and I like to ask this question. You've been around, you know, Pat Chambers, Jay Wright. Like, you've been around some, some very good coaches. I go back to Dick Myers, you know what I'm saying, when you played for him. So. Uh, he's legendary. People don't understand. Dick Myers, I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I'm pretty confident it's true. Nobody had a better win-loss record against Morgan Wooten in history than Dick Myers. You I'm always positive he beat, he beat Morgan Wooten more than any other coach in the history of Morgan's career. It had, it had to be. That'd be because you, you might be right. You may be right. That's something worth looking at. Yeah, but Dick Myers, it was unreal. Un, un, yeah. Uh, I was so fortunate to play for that guy. Um, I learned repetition was probably one of the most important things to to anything, let alone basketball. Repetition, repetition, repetition. It's what made our team my senior year, who was not nearly as talented as some of the other teams in our league, we, we were unstoppable because of the repetition and and the and the cohesiveness. Yeah. Wow. 
So I, I ask you this, like if you had a chance to sit down with three or four coaches and that could be across any time and just pick their brain, you know, you just want to know how, how they did it, you know, what made them tick. Who would those, I mean, you, you experienced Jay, you experienced Pat, like who would those guys be that you'd be like, you just want to sit down and grab lunch or dinner and spend a couple of hours with and, and sit and talk with? Man, you got to, next time you got to give me these questions prior to this interview. Uh, Tom Izzo's one. Um, I just think he's he uh, very similar in, in stature as well as mindset. He's like a mix between um, a lot of coaches that I admire. Um, this is outside of basketball, but Lou Holtz. I grew up a big time Notre Dame fan and uh, I've watched a lot of incredible speeches that Lou Holtz had given. Uh, I love the way he coached Notre Dame football. I was a diehard Notre Dame football most of my life fan. Um, still love them. But Lou Holtz was always someone who I admired and wanted to pick his brain. Um, another football guy, Bill Walsh. Um, I'm reading his book now. It's like an encyclopedia coaching. Um, it's incredible. Um, I'm a big football guy. I believe a lot of things transfer over um to a number of sports but um wow more basketball um i'm gonna have to think about that i'm gonna have to think about that one um i've sat and recruited next to bob huggins but i think bob huggins is uh one of the best coaches in the history of the game for a number of reasons um but I love the way his teams, the love the way his teams play, the way he coaches. Um, I admire him. Uh, who else? I'd probably say Morgan Wooten. You know, I met Morgan a few times. Uh, I was recruited by DeMatha in, in eighth grade. Um, my parents kind of helped guide me towards Gonzaga uh, over, over DeMatha. But Morgan Wooten, I think, uh, again, similar to the other guys for a number of reasons, um, just having a sit-down conversation with him. Um, I just think he was – again, all these guys understood uh, their, the, their sport but also the humanity of, uh, of coaching and understanding that coaching is, is a vehicle for change. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's two things, in my opinion – um, that these guys all used uh, specifically that have the ability to unite. I think music is first and foremost. Music has the ability to unite people from all races, religions, no matter where you are in the world. Um, it doesn't matter what language the music's in. Music has the ability, and I learned this when I was living in South Africa working for Playing for Peace, which is now Peace Players, but music it doesn't matter what part of the world you're in, what language you speak, you play music and people are getting up and dancing all ages, religions, races. Um, it doesn't matter. You, you play some music, people are going to get up and dance and move. Right. So it's the language of love, but then sports, sports, you could roll out a ball. You could roll out anything anywhere in the world. Kids race, religion, same thing. doesn't matter. Black, white, Indian, whatever. You roll out a ball, kids ages five, six, seven, eight, they're just going to start playing. They don't even realize who they're playing with or what they're doing. They're just having a blast and having a ball. So sports has the ability to unite and create change, unlike any other thing in the world other than music, in my opinion. And I think all those guys understood that um, and weren't just fixated on the game itself. They're fixated on human beings and developing incredible human beings that are going to be successful in the real world, regardless of whether or not they play sports or not. And that's, uh, that's ultimately why you get into this business. And, uh, you know, you can get jaded pretty easily if you don't focus on what your why is, so to speak. And ultimately that is your why, you know, when you get to this level, people get caught up in money and fame and this and that, that is not why you got into this business. You know, that's not why you, you worked at five star in the middle of July in a dorm room without, you know, multiple weeks, you know, 14 hours on your feet, coaching kids that, you know, you just don't do it 
for that. I don't ever lose sight as to why you got into what you're trying to do. That's, that's, that's long so winded, long winded, man. I'm sorry. No, that's, no, that's so awesome, but you're awesome. giving me loaded questions, dude. I got those, <laughs> these are questions you have to think about. Like, what's your favorite word or phrase you like to use, man? Like, you know, you probably picked up some good ones, or but what's your favorite word or phrase? I got a couple of them, but attitude is, is number one. Uh, I got a tattooed on my, on my arm here, attitude, right? So Jay Wright, um, we learned that from Jay Wright and, and, and elaborated even further here at Penn State under Pat Chambers, but attitude, man. You know, we got two decisions to make in the morning. We can even think negatively or positive. Other than that, we really don't have control over a lot of what happens throughout the day. There are so many things that are gonna happen throughout your day that you have no control of. But how you react to those things that take place really defines who you are as a man or a woman and what kind of character you have. And let me ask you, Lamar, you like bringing around negative people? No. No. He can't stand being around negative people. And it's so easy to be negative. So, you know, try to choose choose positivity, try to choose energy as much as humanly possible. Um, So attitude defines that. um, And just trying to be a positive influence as much as possible. Um, Cause you're in control of your own thoughts and how you handle certain situations. It's really the only thing you can control. So I would say attitude is without a doubt, number one word. Um, I would say uh, as far as phrase, dream big, dare to fail. Um, dream big, dare to fail. It's, it's, uh, it's a quote from a, a writer called Norman Vaughn. Uh, but, you know, I tell young guys all the time, like dream big, dare to fail, man. You, you know, that's just the reality. You know, people are always going to tell you what you can't do. And if you listen to them, you never will. So, you know, dream big. You're going to fail a hell of a lot more than you succeed. Right. Those, those, those are awesome things. Just simple. And, and it's simple. But you know what? At the same time, it's powerful and it, and it gets across. So I, I love that. Um, I ask this question, like, what's the best piece of advice you think you've ever been given? Don't confuse passion with emotion. Don't confuse passion um, with emotion. You can get too emotional and lose sight of what's going on. Um, but if you're passionate, you're still engaged in what you're what you're presently doing. If you get too emotional, you know you lose your your train of thought, or you get too caught up and um, you make mistakes. So, uh, and I think a lot of what people confuse on the sidelines when they're watching is you're too emotional. Now that's just passion. Believe me, I'm completely dialed in to what I'm doing at that present time. Uh, and if you were in the huddles, you'd know that. Um, but you know, what people do forget is that they don't understand the time commitment and that two and a half hours it comes down to that two and a half hours and it does ultimately come down to wins and losses um, in our profession, uh, at least, at least to, to the measure of success, I would say, but um, so they can be pretty passionate, pretty emotional moments during the games. And you got to just, you got to make sure you don't get too emotional. Don't confuse emotion with passion. Awesome. That's, I love that. Deep. That's deep. Um, you're not, you've never been a self promoting guy. You like your work speaks for itself. Yeah. Something I, something I respect about you. Like if you had to choose three adjectives to describe, you know, yourself, which would you choose? Whew. What man, you're, you're, you dude. got to send a list of questions next time, man. Uh, well, one of the, I'll say this first, Jay Wright and Pat Chambers always said, look, you put your head down, you make this program the best it can possibly be. And everything you want personally is going to take care of itself. But, you know, uh, focus on this right here, make it Villanova basketball or Penn State basketball or Gonzaga basketball, whatever it is, the best it could possibly be. And you're going to get you're going to get everything you want personally. You know, that's the one thing. That's why the self-promotion is nothing that something that I was I was never into. Um, but um I, I, energy, 
Uh, what was the, what, what? How did you phrase the question again? What are the three? Three added. Three added. Three added. Energy is definitely one. I can say that. One. That's definitely yeah. Energy. One. I mean, number one, energy is uh, is 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 a must. You got to be energetic. You got to be passionate about what you're doing. And and uh, if you are that way, you better stay consistent and understand. Because if you show up one day and you're not, everybody knows something's wrong. So you know, um, energy. Energy is definitely something that I have and that I try to bring to the table each and every day. Um, positive attitude. Try to remain positive all the time. You know, we've been 0-10 in this league at the Big Ten. We've been 0-8, 0-6. But the ultimate, the ultimate thing was, you know, analyst on the day of a game, we're 0-8, 0-10, 0-6, four-game loop, whatever it might be. You'd have no idea. If you walked into that gym, music blaring, energy level so high that an analyst would be like, dude, this looks like a 6-0 and team. You'd have no clue that we had lost four, five, or six. So just constant positivity, um, and guys feed off of that. Um, so uh, positive attitude, energy, um, loyal. Loyalty is something that I've learned uh, from my parents, and my family. Um, and over the years from Jay and from Pat and from Steve Turner and Dick Myers and all the others uh, that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of. But loyalty is, uh, unfortunately, it's a dying breed. And you can, and, and look, you're, you could, you could be too loyal and it could, it could essentially hurt your career maybe or hurt your personal life, whatever it is, but never stop being loyal. So, you know, uh, so I, I would say loyalty. Those are three good ones, man. And I'm going to ask you this before I ask you the last question. Like, um, who has or what person or event, it could be person or event, has had the most influence on your life? Oh, my father. My father, and I know a lot of people say that, but my father um, has had probably the most powerful influence on me. Uh, I was one of 10 kids, one of nine boys, and I was the only one out of that group to play basketball um, in high school and beyond. And my father's favorite sport was basketball. He played it at uh, Brooklyn Prep. Um, he refed, you know, Power Memorial against, you know, uh, Lou Alcindor. He, he used to ref his games and he went to Fordham University to play basketball. But back then uh, he was, you know, freshman, played freshman and, and his academic schedule. It wasn't basketball schedule around basketball. It was basketball around schedule back then. So he had to stop after his freshman year in college and and uh, it was a bond that he and I have had, um, you know, when you grow up in a family that big, you got to find your moments with your, with your parents and how you, how you, you know, so that, that's, um, that's a bond that he and I have had. And fortunately that, uh, that no one else in the family had had. So uh, he was always a major influence on me. His work ethic is unlike any other I've ever, I've ever known. Um, so I, I, he instilled that in, in us, um, understanding uh, both my mother and father, how to treat people, you know, the golden rule, treat people the way you want to be treated, you know, no matter what in life, if that's the way you go through, you're going to get hurt. There's going to, going to be negative things, but just remain steadfast in the golden rule. And ultimately good things are going to happen to you. Awesome, so my man. Father, for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Like, and I always like to end with this because I know it brings you back, like knowing what you know now, like what would you tell your young self or younger self, to prepare for as an assistant coach? Patience is a virtue, man. Stay patient. Just stay patient. Um, everything happens for a reason. Continue to stay patient. Continue to understand why and remember why you do what you do because there will be ups and there will be downs. Um, but ultimately, um, remember this whole thing is about relationships and, um, and never lose sight of why you got into what you're doing. So patience, having patience. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, look, man, I look, I want to thank you again, Keith, for being a guest on the show and being unmasked. Is there anything you want to leave with the viewers before we go? No, I just want to say thank you so much. And, um, everybody continue to stay safe out there, man. Stay positive, stay safe. Awesome. Well, thank you viewers for watching another great show. Stay tuned for the next guest as we get them unmasked. See you next time and stay safe. <laughs>